These are resolutions of conflicts between cultures and societies that operate on a similar level, like the victory of the Romans over the Sassanids in 630 AD. Often the conquest is by a high culture of an exterior, primordial society, a society of barbarians. The expansion of the Roman Empire is the story of both these types of conquest. But highly complex and very large societies can also be conquered by a compact force of militarily irresistible barbarians. This was happening in Italy during the 600s as the Lombardi, who had come down from central Germany, tightened their hold on Roman society in northern and central Italy. But theirs was the usual pattern. They were quickly adopting the style of life and the values of the society they had come to settle in. One can see the same process happen repeatedly in China over many centuries. The barbarian outsiders, inhabitants of harsh regions which train them for warfare, break in upon a settled state containing many rich cities with a highly productive agriculture and administered by an educated bureaucracy. The barbarians may loot, burn and slaughter in the initial flush of victory, but soon they settle down to rule the civilization they have taken possession of. Within remarkably short time spans, all looked to Constantinople. The Lombards and many other groupings from Central Europe became Romano-Christians and looked to Rome. But there has been one exception to this universal pattern, and I believe one only. Islam is the only world religion to have been developed by a barbarian, largely illiterate and unurbanized people, lacking in a documentary tradition and educational infrastructures. What Arab culture did have was a strong orally transmitted tradition of poetic utterance. This is clearly evident in the collection of religio-poetic sayings and teachings attributed to the Prophet in the somewhat later compiled Qur'an, literally the recitation. His teachings were loosely modelled on the precedents available at the time and marked by heavy, if a highly eclectic, borrowings from Judaism and to some extent from Christianity. Conceived, it appears, in the mind of a single individual, the teachings of Muhammad offered an abrupt and absolute answer to the problems of a profoundly tribal society. It is a remarkable characteristic of Islam that it has never challenged tribalism throughout the long centuries of its existence, but rather has lived in a natural symbiosis with it. Indeed, Islam brought the values and outlook of tribalism with it as it expanded into the Near East, North Africa and Central Asia. Regions which had known a millennium of the Greco-Roman way of life, where tribal social formations had long been superseded by urban, familial and civic structures appear gradually to have reverted to the primordial tribal pattern as a result of Islam's spilling out from Arabia over them. Even today, when violent conflict is reported from Iraq to Libya, Western journalists on the spot tell us that this or that tribal group forms the power base of some modern tyrant. The solution that Muhammad appears to have offered the Arab tribes if we can take the document called the Shahifat al-Madina, the Pact of Medina, as containing authentic features, was to subsume the always feuding tribes into a single great tribe, the Ummah, whose tribal members submitted, again Islam means submission, to a single god. The singularity of the deity was the key to tribal union. Sentence 42 of the document states, quote, if any dispute or controversy likely to cause trouble should arise, it must be referred to God and to Muhammad, the messenger of God. End quote. A fiercely partisan document, the Pact of Medina, usually dated at 622 AD, is no constitution, as it is insistently called. To read the text makes this immediately apparent. It is a document for a military alliance under a single authority, guaranteeing to those who were loyal the protection of God's justice, that is, their traditional tribal rights, such as the payment of blood money for wounds inflicted 
or murders committed within the community, the Ummah. The Ummah was conceived then within the setting of an internecine war between the Quraysh tribe of Mecca and the tribes, some of them Arabian Jewish, allied together unto Muhammad at Medina. It was designed for war. And war is what ensued, a dynamic of unending aggression in the name of the community of the believers, in the name of their God, the protector and sponsor of the tribe of all the tribes. For this was above all an ethnic religion. It was the religion of the Arabs. The Judaic idea of the tribes of Israel as the chosen people of the one God was taken over and taken to heart. The Arabs were that people and their God spoke Arabic. This is why Jerusalem played such an important, if ambiguous, role in the formation of Islam. The original Qibla, or direction of obeisance and prayer, was towards the north, to the holy sanctuary of Jerusalem. It was while at Medina that Muhammad switched its polarity towards Mecca. The Arabs were the race singled out by God for his particular favour. Islam began not as a universalist religion for all humanity, but as an ethnic religion of exclusivity. Knowledge of this fact helps us understand the characteristics of the first century and more of Islam's development. The ethos and way of life of the tribes, when magnified into a tribe of all the Arabs, makes their military expansion not only comprehensible, but inevitable. For there was no moral barrier, no inhibition, for the Bedouin tribesmen, nor for their leaders, the companions of the Prophet, between the peace and justice that was to prevail within the Ummah and the aggression that was to be practiced outside it. This is as clear from the text of the Pact of Medina as it is from much of Muslim history. The tribesmen understood the peace of God as applying rigorously within the community of the believers, that is, among themselves, and as applying not at all outside it. The world was conceived then, quite logically, as two opposed regions, the Dar al-Islam, the abode of submission to God, and the Dar al-Harb, the abode of war. A non-believer from outside the region of Muslim power was called a Harbi, a person from the region of war. So it is a common misconception to think that the Muslim invasions were spurred by the desire to spread Islam, just as it is equally misconceived to think that they were not. Warfare for the seizure of booty and the subjugation of one's enemies were simply natural reflexes for the tribesmen of Arabia. Scholars are now largely agreed that the central Arabian economy at this time was rude in the extreme. The whole society and culture was devoted to the practice of war as the highest and most honourable of activities. What Islam gave them was above all peace among themselves and thereby unity as a people, a people under their God. In this vision of society, there is no difference between the social, the political, and the religious spheres. All are aspects of the same thing. There is no clergy in Islam, none whatever in its early phase, no separate order of religious specialists, as there is in Christianity. Peace was assured by the acceptance of a single charismatic authority to settle feuds and give leadership. That authority was legitimized by God, that is, through direct association with his prophet. This is why the precise lineage of the immediate successors of Muhammad has bitterly divided Muslims down the centuries. In the previous episode we have seen how, immediately following the submission of the tribes of the European Peninsula to the political and religious hegemony of the companions of the prophet at Medina, that spontaneously, without a plan or hesitation, large-scale raiding was undertaken by the newly coalesced tribesmen into the soft underbelly of the Sassanid Empire. In 633 AD, Abu Bakr authorized a razzia in force under Khalid with an army of about 18,000 men to Alhira and then up the valley of the Euphrates, taking city after city. From the perspective of the city dwellers of the north, the Arabs came out of the desert, as they always had. 
Over the centuries, when the civilized world was weak, the raiders had wreaked havoc, seized what they could carry, and returned back across the desert. The desert gave them security. They could strike when and where they chose, but could not be pursued. The desert functioned just as the sea does for well-practiced raiders and pirates. It was their element, and no sedentary army could match them in it for speed and endurance. Geographically, the Arabian desert juts up from the peninsula like a huge tongue to the edges of the fertile coastlands of Syria, as it does the fertile valley of the Euphrates. From an Arabian perspective, each of these is equally accessible across the waterless wastes, without distinction. The east-west frontier, fought over and repeatedly fortified by the Romans and the Persians for century after century, was for them simply irrelevant. Which is why in 633, substantial raiding parties had also been sent from Medina into Roman Syria. There are multiple Muslim sources for these events, but they were written two or three centuries later, and they contradict one another. As Fred Donner says, quote, There is no way, on the basis of the Arabic sources alone, that we can determine which of these conflicting reconstructions is to be preferred. End quote. Where there is confirmation from Roman chroniclers, like Theophanes the Confessor, it is evident that Abu Bakr sent instructions from Medina to Khalid that he should bring his army from the Euphrates westward into Syria to bolster the forces already there. These had already taken Bostra, Gaza, Perla, Scythopolis, and Damascus, but would soon have to face Roman forces gathering at the command of Emperor Heraclius at Antiochia, who now took the barbarian threat seriously. The emperor entrusted two field armies to the Sacellarius, Theodorus and the Armenian general Bathan, and the other two Baanes. The two moved to join up in eastern Syria, but before they could, Baanes' troops mutinied and declared him emperor, an old Roman problem in a moment of greatest crisis. The main Roman army, which in the Muslim tradition is put at the fantastical figure of a quarter of a million men, encountered the now concentrated Muslim forces at the river Amukhtas, known in Arabic as Yarmuk. There the decisive confrontation took place. The battle lasted days. The Roman sources mention the fact that a dust storm blew up from the south and effectively blinded the legionaries as they faced the repeated onslaughts of the Saracens. Muslim sources speak of the Romans fighting like slaves, being chained together in long lines. This must have been their perception when they saw the phalanx formation of the infantry, the practice of Western armies since the days of Marathon and Thermopylae. Being beaten back, the Romans found themselves in a physical trap, as the precipitous ravine of the Amuktas River was at their back and they could no longer maneuver. Many, we don't know how many, threw themselves into the ravine rather than wait in the crush for their turn to be butchered. Theophanes says that 40,000 perished that day, the 23rd of July, 636 AD. The outcome transformed the strategic situation. There was no longer any Roman field army in all of Syria. Emperor Heraclius, now an ailing old man, made the decision to abandon the provinces of Roman Syria and Palestine altogether and to form a redoubt in what is today southeast Turkey, in the Taurus Mountains of Cilicia. He destroyed all fortifications on his retreat and burned the crops to impede the enemy. He himself returned to Constantinople to his sickbed. The enemy instead turned their gaze upon a richer and a closer prize, Egypt. The Patriarch of Alexandria, Kuros, panicked and sent the Muslims in Syria a great sum of gold as a down payment and promised to pay them 200,000 denarii every year in tribute 
if they would desist from invading Egypt. Heraclius was angered when he heard of this and appointed Manuelos, another Armenian, as Augustalis of Egypt, that is, governor. He arrived with a small army at Alexandria. Theophanes says that when the Saracens came to collect the tribute, Manuelos told them that Curas had been unarmed and had paid, but that he was not and wouldn't pay. A Muslim force of 20,000 under Amir al-As entered from Syria via Pelusium, which they besieged and took. After several indecisive engagements, the Romans concentrated at the very formidable triangular-shaped fortress at the neck of the Nile Delta called Babylon, not to be confused with the Babylon in Iraq, which had been built by the emperor Trajan five centuries before. One feature of the Arabs at this early phase in their expansion was their lack of anything like siege technology. They could wait and try to starve the inhabitants. More often they could use scaling ladders. Large Roman fortresses, with a garrison too small to mount the whole circumference in force, could thus be taken. In the long term, the key to the success of Muslim armies in provoking capitulations was the stark contrast they offered the citizens between surrender and resistance. To open the gates meant that all would be spared, there would be no destruction, life could continue and property could be retained. The subjugated inhabitants had to pay the jizya, however, as the Prophet had stipulated. To resist and be taken by storm meant that every adult male would be slaughtered and all the women and children would be taken as slaves. This dire fate accorded with the practices of the Arabian tribal wars. The ultimatum now had the sanction of the Prophet. During the siege of Babylon, news arrived from Constantinople that the old emperor Heraclius had died in 639. We are not told by reliable sources how the fortress of Babylon was taken, but it fell probably in April 641. Two years later, the cities of the province of Pentopolis the five cities of Cyrenaica, which is now eastern Libya, fell to the Muslims also. Once again, as in Syria, a concentration of forces and a single great defeat was sufficient for the Romans to lose all of Egypt. Alexandria fell on the 29th of September, 641 AD. The last ships left the famous quayside bearing dignitaries and other refugees bound for Constantinople. And here we encounter one of those strange mental constructs of our current Western culture. The Muslim accounts are quite clear and traditional. The people of Syria and Egypt threw open their gates at the approach of the Muslim armies and joyously welcomed them as liberators from the oppressive Roman rule, whereupon everybody converted to Islam. Several Western scholars have aligned themselves with this wholly fanciful and unrealistic story, by seizing upon the sectarian comments of a monophysite monk from the Western Delta, the chronicle of John of Nicu, who wrote that it was, quote, the heresy of the Romans, end quote, that had led to the fall of Egypt, and that anyway, the pure Christian faith of the people whom he called the Egyptians, had brought the new Muslim overlords to look favorably upon the monophysite church. In modern Western accounts, one encounters a story of a fully-fledged Coptic, Egyptian-speaking national church, vehemently anti-Roman, anti-Orthodox and anti-Greek, which had been persecuted by fellow Christians and who now could bask in freedom under the benign Islamic tolerance of a type unknown in the Christian world. However, the evidence of the papyri that survived from after the conquest present a very different picture. These are not chronicles, but relate to mundane legal and administrative matters, such as the collection of papyri from Aphrodito, Apollonius Anno, and from Oxyrhynchus. For one thing, these are either still in Greek or are translated directly from the imperial Greek legal codes into Coptic, phrase for phrase. They show a loyalty to Constantinople and a touching belief in an eventual restoration of things to the way they had always been. A legal document from Apollonius Anno begins with the oath, quote, By the holy and consubstantial trinity, 
and the imperial salvation, end quote. It dates from six years after the fall of Alexandria. Almost a full century later, in 724, the Monophysite Patriarch of Alexandria, living under Muslim rule, was composing his Easter message in Greek, not Coptic and certainly not in Arabic. Tolerance is a word which derives its layers of meaning from being a key concept of the European Enlightenment, which occurred over a thousand years later. These specifically European meanings had no purchase upon the mentalities of either late antiquity nor of the Middle Ages, either Christian or Muslim. What has been referred to as tolerance is the total disinterest by the Muslim conquerors in the religion or the religious disputes among those whom they regarded contemptuously as polytheists and image worshippers, if not as blasphemers. The conquerors faced an enormous practical problem. They numbered only tens of thousands, and they had within the space of a few years come to dominate a society of perhaps 10 million people in the Roman provinces alone. They were an alien people, strangers in a strange land, and they knew it. They proudly referred to themselves as the emigrants. Citizens of Antiochia, Jerusalem and Alexandria were astonished at how poor and emaciated they looked, how threadbare their clothes were, and how simple their weapons and armour. In all other cases in history, such uncouth conquerors would have settled down and soon adopted the language, the customs, the religion, and the culture of the vast majority among whom they now lived, as happened in China and in Western Europe. This did not happen in the case of the Muslims, quite the contrary. They had come as an army, as an army of God's chosen people. They needed to maintain their solidarity among themselves if they were to keep the vanquished society down and further expand. Back in Medina, their new Khalifa, Umar, set out a policy designed to maintain this solidarity as a military caste. They were not to take possession of the estates of the upper classes for themselves. That would have meant the rapid dissolution and eventually submersion of the Arabs in the indigenous culture. Instead, they built or occupied fortresses away from the main Roman cities, which effectively were barracks for the Muslims alone. They were an army of occupation and wanted to remain so. This is why neither Alexandria, nor Carthage, nor Ctesiphon remains a capital city today, but instead Cairo, Tunis, Basra and Kufa are major, if not capital cities, in those regions. They were all founded as segregated garrison cities by the Muslims. Inside, the warriors did little except pray and exercise their martial skills. They took native women as wives, having converted them first to the religion and to the particular status and practices of the women of Arabia. In this intimate cultural area, it was the mores of the desert camps of Arabia which were imported into the life of Greco-Roman Egypt and Syria, where women had, for time out of mind, lived as freely and publicly as women anywhere in the ancient Mediterranean. These women of the garrison cities were the beginning of a profound, long-term cultural and moral transformation. The warriors lived from the proceeds of the gamina, or war booty, from the fay, tribute exhorted or literally returned to the Muslims, and from the jizya, the specifically religious tax levied on the conquered due to their religious status. The Muslims received free food and other necessities handed out as to barrack soldiers. More importantly, they also received an annual stipend of wealth, each according to his station and depending on how early his tribe had converted to Islam. The money to pay for this came from the heavy taxes imposed on the indigenous Christian population, especially the onerous jizya. One can judge its severity by the behaviour of the populace of Antioch, they had capitulated on terms after a siege and assault. 
One gate was opened while on the opposite side of the city resistance continued. It was fortunate that the two Muslim emirs, when they discussed the matter, decided to treat it as a case of surrender rather than a fight. Otherwise, the men would have been executed and the women enslaved, etc. But once it became clear what was actually meant by the pact of submission and how onerous the jizya was, the Antiochenes took up arms again and had to be bloodily suppressed. There were similar armed revolts by the peasantry in Egypt, which were similarly dealt with. To organize this system, Caliph Umar copied, as in so much else in Islamic culture, what the Arabs had encountered among the Sassanids in Iraq, that is the diwan or divan. Today a divan means a type of couch, but its original meaning related to papers or documents. It was an office of administration where written records were kept of each member of the Ummah in the fortress city and of his entitlements. He went there to receive his provisions and other payments, and annually to receive the lump sum of his stipend. Umar is recorded in Islamic sources of having declared, quote, He who comes to Hijra hurries to stipends, end quote. Hijra meant emigration, in other words, to join the warriors occupying Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. No wonder that tribal contingents kept arriving at Medina, eager to be told which garrison city in the rich north they should travel to. They could see with their own eyes the many thousands of slaves flooding into Medina, as into a clearinghouse for captive human beings. Religiously conceived conquest quickly became a self-reinforcing industry for the whole Arabian Peninsula, drawing in more and more hungry, hardened warriors. This then was an alien military occupation where the aliens were determined to maintain their separateness and aloofness. In Greek, they were called the Saracenoi, Saracens. The Saracens didn't destroy much of the Roman infrastructure or economic assets, for it was these that primarily interested them. The Roman economy continued as before under its usual hierarchy of local officials, who worked under instructions from high Greek-speaking officials at the court of the Muslim governors. An interpretation of regulations that the Prophet had laid down for certain Jewish tribes in Central Arabia served people like Umar to formulate a method of maintaining the rule of his small minority of believers over the immense mass of the polytheist population. There was not the slightest intention of spreading Islam as a religion. Islam was the exclusive and treasured possession of the Ummah, of the community of the warriors. There was no profession other than warfare for an Arab Muslim during this period. The Ummah was the tribes, united as an army of occupation, ruling by right of conquest. The legal status of Dimma was articulated by the leadership. This meant that the subject people were to be left with their reprehensible beliefs and religious practices so long as they did not offer scandal or offence to Muslim sensibilities. There were to be no civil magistrates, but the clergy could act as the organisers of the Christian communities. The bishop was responsible to the Muslim governor for the good behaviour of his flock. These are just some of the aspects of the dhimma, or protection, imposed on the Greco-Roman populace of Egypt and Syria in the immediate aftermath of their defeat if rich stipends were to be paid to the warriors of God, Caliph Omar needed to obtain not only Ganima, war booty, and to extract fay, tribute, there needed to be a mechanism to also extract jizya from the conquered Christians. This mechanism was ready to hand in the form of the Roman, still intact, administrative apparatus. The hundreds of officiales and secretaries dispersed throughout the provinces. Very quickly, the new Muslim overlords brought this apparatus under their direct control and instructed the officials to continue with their census records and tax-gathering procedures, but now they were simply to extract tribute from the mass of the population, for that is what, in early Islamic jurisprudence, the jizya essentially was. An example of this can be seen in the grandfather of St. John of Damascus, Sergius, who had been the chief of the imperial revenue the proto-symbolus 
of the Roman city of Damascus. When that city fell to the Muslims in 637, he stayed on at his post, taking the new name of Mansur ibn Sajun, and proved so essential to the needs of the Saracen chieftain, Mu'awiyah, that he became his chief advisor and trusted confidant. When this man became the Umayyad Caliph in 661, ruling over an enormous empire, Mansur's office extended to imposing and collecting the jizya on his fellow Christians all over these provinces. Arrangements such as these meant that the Muslims, issuing forth on new expeditions from their fortress cities, initially made little direct impact upon the society they held in subjugation. Only the top layer of Roman officialdom interacted closely with the Muslim emirs and new provincial governors, receiving their instructions and presenting their accounts and showing the chests full of imperial Roman coins they had accumulated for their masters. They quickly learned Arabic, while with the bureaucracy beneath them they continued to speak and correspond in Greek. Most of the high officials who had not fled and who found their services needed by the emirs converted to Islam in order to fit in among the new entourages of the Arab chieftains. This situation persisted for about 140 years after the Islamic conquests, both in Egypt and Syria. Indeed, not only the officials, but the whole of Greco-Roman society continued to speak Syriac, Aramaic, Coptic, and for the educated classes, Greek, and to continue to live in their own communities as Christians for fully two centuries after the Islamic conquest, and for several more in attenuated form until about the time of the Crusades. And of course the dynamic of conquest did not stop, with religious zeal in full symbiosis with lust for riches, and military success reinforcing religious exaltation. Razzias were launched through the fortified Roman lines in Cilicia, reaching deep into Anatolia. In 647, Mutauia led raids into Cappadocia, besieging Caesarea, and then into Phrygia, taking enormous booty back to Damascus, while making no attempt to establish a foothold in that region. The destruction wrought upon the cities and villages of Roman Asia Minor was immense. Whole provinces were devastated, provoking mass population flight to the west, leaving a deserted wasteland behind. When, after some nasty family and palace politics at Constantinople, the Senate proclaimed Heraclius's grandson, Constans, as the second emperor of that name in 641, he was but eleven years old. He ruled under the regency of the Senate, led by Nuding of Asia Minor. The civil war between Phocas and Heraclius started the reduction of the garrisons along the Danube. The Sassanid war made it a total reduction. It had taken fifty years for the Avars to migrate into the Balkans. They took Sirmium in 582 AD. Their repulsion from the walls of Constantinople in 626 had caused the collapse of their hegemony over the Slavinii, or Slavs, who had migrated down behind them. Roman supremacy at sea, however, remained unchallenged by the camel riders of the Arid Desert. However, in 645, Alexandria was retaken from the sea by the strategos, or general, Manuel, with a fleet from Rhodes. A reconquest was not to happen, though. The Romans were driven out again the following year. But Mu'awiyah, the governor of Syria, understood from this the need for a fleet and began to ask his Christian advisers how the Muslims could acquire one. Abdullah ibn Sa'ad, the governor of Egypt, took charge of the task and soon Greco-Roman craftsmen were building galleys in the docks of Alexandria. An initial Muslim flotilla raided Cyprus in 649, taking its capital, Constantia. Then they got into their stride, with Christians building and navigating the vessels and Christian slaves rowing them, the Muslim infantry could fight from deck, just as they did on land. They soon found that the sea offered even more opportunities for raiding than the desert had. In 654, Rhodes was devastated. 
the island of Kos was taken and Crete was pillaged. In 655, Constans II sought to restore the Roman monopoly of the Mediterranean. He personally assembled the whole imperial fleet and sailed south along the coast of Lycia, western Asia Minor. He met the Muslims opposite Mount Phoenix. The battle proved a catastrophe for the Romans. The fighting was deck to deck, and they were beaten, losing 500 ships. Constans himself only escaped with his life. And this was a defeat as bad or nearly as Beranian. Sicily was raided by a large Muslim force at this time. The son of the above-mentioned Sergius, also named Sarjun, inspected a job lot of Christian slaves taken from Sicily in the marketplace of Damascus. Among them he found a monk called Cosmas, who was a learned scholar. How many like them must there have been? Sarjun bought him and gave him the job of tutoring his sons, one of whom was the future saint John of Damascus. Emperor Constans returned to Constantinople after the disaster at Phoenix and looked for a solution to the deepening crisis. Troubles came in from all sides. The imperial exarch of Africa, Gregorius, tried to secede from the empire, which was bad enough. Then Gregorius himself was killed and a major Roman army wiped out by the Muslims at the Battle of Sufatula in 648. Probing Ratias were reaching now as far as the city of Carthage, capital of Roman Africa. What saved the situation, temporarily at least, was a flare-up of a dispute within the Muslim elite over the succession to the Caliphate. This is known as the First Fitna, or Civil War. It arose because of resentments over the booty and jizya wealth flowing into the hands of the governors, especially those of Mu'awiyah, governor of Syria, and a claimant to the vacant caliphate. The tribesmen were becoming envious and dissatisfied with their portions, as they saw power concentrate in the hands of the provincial governors, contrary to tribal custom. The challenger was Ali, who was Muhammad's cousin and closest living male relative. The previous caliph, Uthman, this is the origin of the term Ottoman, as we shall see later, had been assassinated in his house in Medina by a group returning from Egypt. Ali and his immediate family were later assassinated in an ambush in Iraq in 661. To this day, people are being killed in numbers, stemming from this event and the division between Sunni and Shiite Islam. In 661, following his seizure of the caliphate, Muawiyah gave the momentous order to move the capital of the Ummah from Medina, Muhammad city, into the heart of the lands of the Hijra, the emigration, to the Roman city of Damascus. In the process, he founded what was to be the Umayyad dynasty. The long-term consequences of this decision are incalculable, but civilizationally, they have proved to be immense. That same year, Emperor Constans left Constantinople with the main body of the Roman forces, passing through Thessalonica, Athens and Corinth, before sailing to Otranto in southern Italy. He failed to take Benevento from the Lombards, due to lack of supplies, and went on to Naples, Neapolis, that sea, the Autocephalia, that is, the ecclesiastical independence from the Bishop of Rome. Then he took his army to Syracuse, the number of troops was too much for the taxpayers of Sicily and southern Italy to support. There was profound resentment within the imperial household when it became clear that Constance was seriously moving to abandon Constantinople. A coup was hatched. On the 15th of September, 668, the young emperor, only 30 at this time, was murdered in his bath by his cubicularius, his chamberlain. His son Constantine, in charge of the state of Constantinople during his father's absence, succeeded him as Constantine IV. In 668, Ukpa ibn Nafi led a large-scale razzia into Roman Africa, capturing the outlying fortresses erected against the Berber tribes and the inland cities. 
the Roman exarch was left with nothing but the coastal heartland of the province. Ukbar advanced as far as the Atlantic coast to Mauritania. Opposed effectively by the tribal Berbers of the interior, in 670 Ukbar built the fortress city of Kairouan on the model of Fustat on the Nile, the origin of Cairo, and Kufa in Iraq as the bridgehead for the suppression of the Berbers and the conquest of the remainder of Roman Africa. While Africa, the main seat of Latin-speaking Christianity after Italy, was in the throes of fending off successive Muslim assaults and retreating further each time, in the eastern Mediterranean, at the centre of the great conflict, matters were rising to a crescendo. In 669, Caliph Mut'awiyah sent his son, Yazid, at the head of a strong army to penetrate Asia Minor. The same year that Kairouan was founded, Yazid's forces took Hizikus as a naval base on the Sea of Marmara, opposite Constantinople itself. The Caliph at Damascus was intent on bringing the invasion of the Roman Empire to the same shattering climax as that of the Sassanid one before it. Constantinople had to be taken by Islam. To further his grand strategy, the Muslims built up their fleet and took logistically useful ports along the west of Asia Minor, including, in 672, Smyrna near Ephesus. The intention was to strangle the great Roman city through a prolonged siege and naval blockade. Emperor Constantine IV marshaled all the resources he could. Provision was made for convoys to come from the ports of the Black Sea with supplies. Among the refugees from Heliopolis in Syria was an architect named Kalinikos, who proposed a new mechanism he had developed. This used a pipe system in the form of the well-known Greek siphon, used to propel a lighted resin and raw petroleum mixture at sufficient velocity so that its flaming viscous fluid would carry some distance and not affect the engine itself. The Greeks and Romans had built immense siphons out of stone for centuries to propel the water of an aqueduct down one side of a valley and up the other. The flame-throwing siphon worked in trials and was manufactured in the workshops of Constantinople and mounted on several war galleys. It has gone down in history as Greek fire. It was well that the emperor had made such preparations, for in 674 AD a huge Muslim fleet arrived opposite the Golden Horn, and its troops disembarked to dig earthworks against the land walls of Constantinople. This is not the last time we will hear of the effectiveness of this great work of Roman military engineering, finished at immense expense by the Emperor Theodosius in 413, 260 years previously. This time the Muslims had substantial siege engines with them. They had had the Roman military manuals translated and read to them, and had employed Syrian engineers to make Roman siege equipment. Militarily, within four decades, they had moved on from being a massed camel-mounted desert army to being capable of very large-scale naval and siege operations. The siege lasted five whole years. The currents and storms on the Sea of Marmara were new to the Muslims, and they had to withdraw for the winter to Sisychus. During the campaigning seasons, both the sea and the land walls of Constantinople proved impregnable, while engagements offshore showed the remarkably devastating power of the galley-mounted flame-throwing siphon. By 679, Mu'awiyah had to concede that the effort could no longer be sustained, not even with the caliphate's immense resource base. He even agreed to pay a token tribute of 5,000 gold. By 680 AD, the Islamic caliphate was so vast and still expanding in other theatres that this setback was easily absorbed and its ideological significance dismissed. Looking back from his palace in Damascus, the now aged Mutawiyah may have consoled himself that he had started out as a member of the prominent Meccan tribe of the Banu Abd Shams and had led the original opposition to Muhammad. They had surrendered and converted, which is the same thing, when Muhammad took Mecca in 630. 
Now his son, Yazid, was ready to become hereditary caliph after him and would rule an empire of previously unknown breadth, stretching from the Atlantic deep into Central Asia. Constantinople and the Roman Empire were but a small thing in comparison. Half, and it was the better half, of that empire was already in Muslim hands. Their doom was surely awaiting them. The question was when would Allah indicate the time was ripe. Mu'awiyah, if he had thought such thoughts, would have been correct, but the time scale was very wrong. The working out of this fate we shall see over the course of the coming 15 episodes. <laughs>